smartest question you've been asked at this conference so far? Or the most interesting question? Or the most interesting statement you've heard somebody make? Huh. Um, uh, the most interesting statement was uh, Bill Moyers saying, uh, we have to tell the story ourselves. <laughs> I just think that is the heart of everything that we're doing here. Uh, at least everything that I'm doing that's coinciding with this conference is we have to start telling the stories ourselves and we can do that because the media world has changed whereas 20 years ago when I started in this field and 40 years ago when Moyers did, that wasn't really possible. Um, so let's put some, some meat on that. How do you think, I mean, here's the criticism that get, get, gets made. It's like, yeah, technically speaking, we now have the tools to tell our own stories. Yeah. But what about distribution? What about audience? What right. if we're telling our stories to an audience of, you know, 12? Yeah. Um, is that still a problem in your mind? Um, uh, that's annoying. Here's the way I look at it. The fact is that the tools have been distributed. In an empirical sense, it is true that you can now shoot video, edit it, and distribute it yourself for under $100. And um, it's true that we don't know what this fact means yet. We don't know that it's a revolution in control. We don't know that it's going to overturn the hierarchy. All we have in the beginning is this abstract potential that power has been redistributed. So it is up to the people who recognize that to pick up these tools and start using them. And that's the stage that we're at. People are picking up the tools and they're starting to use them. And then a whole bunch of people who would rather talk about it than do it rush in and say, well, wait a minute, that's not going to replace the Wall Street Journal. Or, wait a minute, people are just talking to themselves, and they raise all these objections, all of which are totally valid. And the people who are picking up the tools just have to keep using their tools and going on. And there will be debate, and there will be argument about it. But there's no stopping this. I mean, if you give people the means to be creative, with uh, a social form, the media, that is integral to their lives, they are going to pick that up and use it. Whatever you think about it, whatever names you give them, they're going to do it. And as a social critic, as a writer, as an activist, myself, as a teacher, I'm interested in what these people are going to do. The people formerly known as the audience. They came to Memphis <laughs> and they're having like a really good time. That's great. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the potential and the shift. I think, I mean, I really like what you said. Nobody can know for certain what this, what this means. Anybody who claims to is probably yeah. full of baloney. But what do you think is the most positive kind of potential scenario for the way that people could use this technology? To not just like in frivolous ways, but what do you think is the sort of democratic potential of this shift that you're talking about? Well, let's look at Wikipedia. Uh, What's the idea there? To make an unreliable encyclopedia? No. The idea was that sophisticated knowledge about things people regularly need to know about isn't freely available on the net. We can't expect the government or Encyclopedia Britannica to put it there. So let's try and create it ourselves as best we can and use the new tools that we have to do that. Well, it worked in the sense that a free encyclopedia with thousands of problems and weaknesses and, uh, and traps is there. It's a resource. It can be used. And it's simply that fact that people can now create their own means for informing themselves. That fact alone has a great deal of social significance. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just not that interested in people who want to tell me how insignificant this is right now. <laughs> I don't care what they say. I'll listen to them. But it's a very rare moment when a major social institution has to rebuild itself while you're around for it. Uh, and you have to realize that when 
fundamental shifts take place, like changing your platform, changing your production, moving to uh, a new technology, uh, a whole bunch of ideas come up for grabs at that time. Self-definition, uh, people's sense of what they're doing can shift. It's a very fluid moment. So that's where we are. We've been here for a couple of years. It's not going to last forever. Uh, so while it's open like that, and while the forms aren't settled, we don't know how it's going to work. That's when people with critical consciousness, with ideas, with stuff to try, experimental spirit can make a big difference. So because I'm on free press's dime here, let's talk a little bit about policy and politics and how that can sort of help foster the kind of, of innovation you're talking about, or at least not screw, not screw it up. What do we need to do in 2007 uh, politically to help foster the, the, the growth and the potential that you're talking about? Well, <laughs> I would just start with something that happened to me like five minutes ago, uh, where I met Commissioner Copps in the hall. And I was very impressed with what they had to say at the conference. I'm very impressed that they're here. And it's clear that he's here, first of all, to learn about what's going on around the country to meet important players, and because this is a constituency of his, and because the existence of a movement like this, an organization capable of bringing thousands of people together, is part of his power, his power. That's why he's here. And I told him, I think it's great that you're here. And he said, are you kidding? I, I have to be. So right there, there is a link, you see, between the policymaker in government and the social movement. Now, uh, this would not have happened if free press uh, couldn't combine a policy organization. We should change what Washington is doing with a movement of people who are themselves producers of media. That's the difference. We've always had a policy community that was interested in uh, public interest legislation about the media industry. We've had that. What we haven't had is a movement of people concerned about that issue who are themselves becoming producers and themselves gaining power. And that's what this movement is about. That's what this conference is about. That's why COPS, the commissioner, was here. Uh, and that's why this is not just a bunch of hippies getting together and trying out their cameras. You know, it's a political event. What would you say to somebody who's um, kind of at the forefront of um, the uh, user-generated sort of content mm -hmm. sort of movement? It's like, well, I'm new media. I'm a blogger or I'm a, I'm a U YouTube video producer. Um, I don't need to care about media reform because that's the old media and I'm part of the new. Well, it's just very naive. <laughs> Um, you are a small player and you can be crushed by big players. You don't really need to know much more than that. But at the same time, I, I identify with part of that attitude in the sense that uh, people who are doing new and interesting stuff should mainly just keep doing their work. That's what they mainly should do. And they should be aware of the big context and they should know who is fighting for their interests. Um, but they should keep doing their work. I think there's, there's a great deal uh, to that. And secondly, um, I would say that uh, if you are uh, a content producer, the first thing you need to find is uh, users for your content. When you have a community of users, now you're doing something. Uh, and, and as you succeed, you'll find that at the community of users runs into the media complex and the system of law that we have and regulation. And so as you succeed at what you're doing as a new media producer, you eventually run into policy issues, whether you want to or not, just through the growth of your enterprise. Uh, so that would be my response. But then I'm a college professor. You know, we never change. Uh, 
The press traditionally has uh, defined itself as a kind of a watchdog. They're, it's an institution that is supposed to watch stuff happen, and not make stuff happen. Although totally. this line is often you know, necessarily quite blurry. Mm. Do you think that the new kind of um, media sort of innovation that you're talking about is going to potentially result in kind of a new idea of what the press is? Reverend, Reverend Yearwood's uh, in an earlier interview says that he thinks that media needs to run parallel to movements. That in the civil rights movement, if you wanted to participate in the civil rights movement, yeah. you turned on your radio to find out what was happening. Right. And in his and in his mind, media has become disconnected from right. those movements and needs to reattach itself to them. Right. What do you, what do you think about that? Oh man, that's a really complicated, interesting question. Really, really big question. Um, well, I think a few things. First, the press uh, doesn't stay in the same shape for very long. Uh, if you look at the press history from the first time that you could say there was such an institution, which is in the 18th century, to now, what you see is not one press, but uh, an institution remaking itself several times as uh, first of all, the technology for creating it has changed, like with advances in printing and radio and television, uh, and also as uh, the society that it was addressing changed. And so we've never had one kind of press or one idea of what journalists should do. In fact, what, we, what our journalists like to call the traditional view of professionalized press maintaining a professional distance from the scene of politics and presenting itself as an official watchdog and in sort of an objective observer. That idea, which is an idea, is approximately uh, 80 years old. And I, I think we're at the end of, of that idea. We're certainly living through the crash and burn of the watchdog press. I mean, there isn't much left to that notion. It was obliterated by the Bush war machine. It was run over, it was humiliated. So even if we do have a watchdog press in the future, it will be one that's ri risen from the ashes or rebuilt itself after uh, disaster and fall down. So this is part of why I say, though, that at this particular time, all these ideas are up for grabs and all these definitions are fluid. And so anyone who comes to me and tells me, here's what journalism is, I listen to them, but it's not, it's not important. <laughs> you know, what's important now is trying to describe the different ways that people might reconstitute the press. And that is where blogging and and citizen-produced media become very important. So for example, if you are a citizen journalist and you have a public that consists of 400 people whose kids attend the same school, that's your whole public, that is extremely significant act of journalism. But for the local newspaper, that is not a significant body of people. It's not a significant, right? It's not big enough. And so, that's what I mean. It's like the whole notion of who you're serving and why and what an act of public service is it varies tremendously across the context you're operating in, the scale of your operation, the people you're addressing, the community. And so I think what we'll have and we have now is a world where lots of people practice journalism and they have lots of different kinds of motivations and they're members of different groups in different ways as opposed to being these kind of creatures from another universe who drop in on ours and stand in front of the White House and deliver their report, you know? My uh, last question for AJ. Um, Something interesting happened for me uh, uh, personally around the, the, the net neutrality battle. And, and what mm. happened was I kind of stopped thinking of the internet as something that just kind of happened to me. 
like that was just kind of there that other people made decisions about. Mm. And I kind of had this moment where like, hey, there's a battle over the future of the internet and yeah. we can actively shape it. Totally. And yeah. there's something that happens there that's sort of beyond that one issue. Yeah. You kind of get, you kind of get politicized in a way where it's like, politics isn't just about a bunch of sort of bureaucrats talking about policy. It's like, we're actively making this up as we right. go along and we can have a hand in shaping it. Right. How do you think that we can help that idea or that, that sort of uh, a moment of awareness spread? Right. Well, I think that what you described is, is very poignant uh, experience. It is. It's like, uh, wait a minute, this is my baby, you know? And I think if people feel, genuinely feel, a sense of ownership because they are creating media, then their whole attitude towards the issue, policy issue, what the media is going to be, changes, of course. Uh, and that's why uh, it's important to realize that participation itself just like in Little League sports, participating is important. Right? If you're a parent, you know that. You start to know that as soon as your kid starts playing sports. It's like, wait a minute. What I really want this kid to do is play soccer. Just learn the game and just participate. And if he doesn't become this or that, who cares? Because this is a participant sport. Right? So that idea uh, is, I think, do for a rebirth in media. And it is, after all, the basic democratic idea, right? <laughs> is that the world is not a spectator sport. It is ours to own and make and reshape. Uh, that's the greatness of, uh, of cultural democracy. So uh, you can think of it like this. When I was working in the civic journalism movement, which predated citizens' journalism and citizens' media, uh, it was mostly an attempt to find enlightened journalists in the professional class who might give citizens a break. And that's what we were doing, right? And so the target, if you will, was professional journalists. And they themselves told stories of the disconnect between themselves and citizens, because they had experienced it in many different ways. And one of the most compelling stories they told was how people told them that um, the newspaper used to be called and thought of as our newspaper. And at some point, they didn't know when, it became the newspaper. Right? So. In civic journalism, the professional journalists were all kind of proud of this insight and determined to say, and we want to become, you know, we want to go back to when it was our newspaper. But they didn't really mean it or they didn't really know how to do it. Well, the internet has done that. It's back to where we can say this is our newspaper. And it doesn't mean that the newspaper is going to go away, but it does. Uh, change how you feel about the tools of media. And let's face it, they've been distributed. <laughs> you know, it's like that happened. You were around when it occurred. You better get in on it because it's not going to last forever. You know, that's why we're here. <laughs>